There we go. All right, so the topic is SQLize. Um, you've probably heard this this uh, this um, tool banded about, and we're wondering what it was and why we're using it. Uh, so I've entitled this Models Migrations Oh My, and we're going to go in exactly that order. Uh, we're going to first uh, cover something called the three schema approach, which will um, give you some language to talk about um, databases and database models. Uh, then we're going to just go straight into an, a simple express application using SQL, no SQLize, just using SQL. Uh, we're going to cover what an ORM is, which is what SQLize is. Um, and then we'll do some demos with SQLize models and migrations and then talk about the oh my at the end. <coughs> uh, all right. So before we dive in, some really useful language is thinking about data models in three different types. You have your conceptual model, your logical model, and your physical model. Now, when you're thinking about relationships between individuals, you, you normally start at the conceptual level. So there are five people in this room. So conceptually, we have five entities called people, and we have, an ob you have, you have a room. And we can define an association or relationship between the five people belonging to this room. Mm -hmm. We could say that uh, a many-to-many -many relationship probably wouldn't make sense at any one point in time, since a person can only be in one room at a time. All of those things are the conceptual level of the data model. Once you've defined your conceptual data model of, all right, we've got people and we've got rooms and people can belong in rooms, that's conceptual, you can talk about the logical data model. Now, at the logical data model, you're still not talking about um, like how you're defining it in SQL, you're putting attributes to the relations. So I'm a person, persons belong in rooms, a person has a name, a person has an age, a person has an occupation, etc. A room has a location, uh, a room has access control requirements, etc. All of those are attributes. You can talk about the primary key. Um, generally speaking, you want to your primary key to not be something like, uh, that's useful. So while a person might have a social security number, you probably don't want to use that as your primary key. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you'll have a foreign key. So a, what key? a foreign key. A foreign key is what you use to um, make and enforce constraints on associations. So if you have, you might have a room and a room, um, well, you'd have a person and the person would say which room they're in at any given time. It would be the most sensible way to do it. So there's a foreign key relationship between person and room. So within person, you would have a column that says, say, room ID, that says the room that they're in at any given point in time. If you were doing like a snapshot, and if you if you if you if you're going back to a conceptual data model that included time, then you'd have to iterate. So that's where you kind of you can be, you can kind of move between your conceptual model and your logical model. So right now our conceptual model was one point in time, people in rooms. You could say, all right, actually we want our conceptual model to include a concept of time. How do you include that? And that will trickle down to the logical model and the physical model. Um, you don't start talking about like the implementation details of SQL until you get to your physical model. So then you have table names and column names and data types, etc. So for example, a person has um, <laughs> An age, an age is might be an integer with certain validation constraints. You can't have a negative age, for example. So that would be a validation constraint on a column name called age with the data type integer. Mm -hmm. um, and here's sort of a. It takes a while. Yeah, it takes a while. Like a really long time. Wow. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, these are sort of slides that illustrate this. So conceptual data model, just your concepts and their relations, logical data model, some attributes, physical data model, the implementation details of the columns and validation constraints and all the rest of it. It's important to note that the physical model might look completely different than the logical model. So if you're doing like a many-to-many -many relationship, you're gonna have an intermediate table. The intermediate table probably wouldn't exist in the logical model since it would be enough at the logical model to say, all right, people and 
I don't know, hobbies have a many-to-many -many relationship. All right. So now we're going to... It would not... Sorry. Mm -hmm. For clarification. The people to habits is a many-to-many... Um, people to hobbies is a many-to-many -many relationship. So, mm -hmm. and you said that means it's not one of those three conceptual models? Right. So the implementation mm -hmm. of how you would make a many-to-many -many association yes. is via intermediate table. Okay. The, the, the intermediate table exists in the physical, physical model. Physical conceptual model. The, the physical model. The physical model. Yep. The many to many uh, intermediate table. Oh, this is so slow. It's incredibly slow. But I think I, I know where they are. <laughs> okay, cool. But now I see them. So, the logical model. Okay, and so what does that mean for the a many many relationship when it comes to the conceptual model and the logical model? It, uh, I guess my it, question it, is, what was, what's the point that it is part of the implementation so it is then part of the physical model design? Okay, so th thinking about things in terms of conceptual models, logical models, and physical models help mm -hmm. you separate concerns. Got if it. I am thinking conceptually, uh, say I am a project manager, mm -hmm. I don't care that there's an intermediate table that defines the relationship. Yeah. I can fare conceptually people, rooms, what are the constraints on people in rooms that I know as a human being? Got it. Yeah. The logical model is what's going to be used by the developer um, if you're using something like an ORM, and we'll talk about that later, mm -hmm. which is these are my entities, these are their relationships, and now I can run queries on them in a query language without having to worry about the underlying SQL. The physical model encodes how exactly it's stored. Okay. So it would be entirely possible to, say, have in the logical model some settings. And the, in the physical model, those settings will be encoded as a JSON-B type, which is a thing, which is a thing, and it means that you can, in a relational database, just store random key value data Great. and index it if you need to. Okay. But from the perspective of an application developer, um, I matter. may or may not care about yeah, that. Exactly. So you want to be clear whether you're talking about your conceptual, your logical, or your physical. Generally speaking, with non-technical stakeholders, you're sticking to conceptual. conceptual. Generally speaking, when you're writing an application, <laughs> you're going to be thinking mostly about logical. And in some cases, you're able to extract the physical model. But mm -hmm. as a developer, particularly the more back-end developers, need to be thinking about their physical model as well. So like a front-end developer, can safely ignore the physical model yeah. because they're they're exposing a representation of the logical model via REST API, yep. for example. Cool. But in order to do that, you need a conceptual model. Yes. Okay. So conceptual models are exactly that. There's there's all sorts of, I guess, intuition. Mm -hmm. So we know that a person can't be in one room in more than one time, right. and you can that that's a thing that's kind of obvious. But how do you put that into the system design? Okay. And is it actually not obvious? Is it not true? Is it possible to have a person in more than one limited time, you know? Um, yes. A phone conference is one way you could do that. And that would break the... The conceptual Exactly. Model. Terrible. Databases. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now we're going to go on to looking at an example in straight SQL. Um, what? <laughs> Do you see any of these? Oh. Um, okay, I got it. Okay, um, actually, okay. Wow. All right, so I do not know. Well, the, I mean, it's double latency for us viewing it on the screen, but that's also taking a while to get onto the um, Uber. Cool. Actually, stuff. who's casting? I'm casting. Could you stop the cast? I'm going to yeah. try and cast directly. Let's see if it doesn't break my machine. Okay, that's better. All right, mm. well, now, we're, now we're cooking with gas. All right, so now we're going to go into the GitHub repository, Prez SQLize. And we're going to go into the first folder, zero raw SQL. Just so you know, people on Uber conference probably still can't see this. Uh, are you able to see Uber Conference people internally? I guess. Uh, on Uber Conference, I see the terminal. Great. 
Beautiful. It's just me. Wow. So we're gonna we're gonna zoom in a bit. Okay, that's probably too much. Alright. Now we're gonna have a, a simple express application. Um, I did a uh, uh, a yarn in it, a package.json just has you know starting a server and our Postgres. Uh, we've got Postgres running right now, but just so everything's nice and clean, I'm going to take out that container and prune all my volumes. And I'm going to run Postgres. All right. Now, since we're using Postgres, it's useful to be able to see what's in there. So I've just used a command line tool called PSQL to drop into the Postgres database, which is running in Docker. And I can see that there's nothing in here right now. It's an empty database. Mm -hmm. In my Express application, I have app.js. App.js has a controller called get people. And when I go to the, you know, the, the localhost 3000, I'll hit the controller get people. The controller get people will use a client library called PG. It'll connect to the database. And we're going to run a raw SQL query to get everything that's in person and then use the callback style to return all of those roles. Person being the name of the table. Yes. Now, since I'm doing this in straight SQL with no SQLize, I have to manually create my database, which I've just done uh, in, um, via the where is it? Uh, Yarn Postgres command. Exactly with with the with the with the Postgres command, and the, the database name is demo db. Since you put it in the um, the input args, it populates automatically. I then have to create a table, so I'm going to create. This is just a straight SQL. We're talking in SQL right now, so we're talking about the physical model. There are no relationships here. I'm just talking about a person. We have a primary key, which is ID, and some attributes with um, their data types. So for example, the data type for full name is a, is a variable char length, and the data type for created at and updated at is a timestamp with defaults. I can run these with PSQL. And that will create my table. Yay, I've got a table. Yay, I've got a table with this with the schema that I that I mentioned in SQL. Mm -hmm. And now I can run my application. There's nothing there. Woo! It's brilliant. Now I can come back and I can say, all right, now that I have a schema defined, I've got my database, I've got my table, I can insert data into that table. This will be called seeds later, but right now I'm just inserting data into a table. So I'm inserting into a person and I'm inserting full names for John Watts and Charles Ingram, uh, who are two VA veterans. Uh, interesting news stories if you want to Google the names. And I can do the same thing. I can run that. I've done the insertion. My schema is still the same. Yay! I've got data in my database. And I can come back and hit that date, that endpoint. And I've got my JSON blob being returned. Now, because I've put this in an API, um, ha I have an ex an sort of an implicit contract. Um, I'm saying that the contract for my API is ID, full name, created at, and updated at. That's what my API will return. There could be a million other... Mm -hmm. Got it. There yep. could be a million other things in the database, um, but this API is returning ID, full name, created at, and updated at. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, let's say we've been developing for a bit. And... 
for whatever reason, we need to change our data model. And instead of full name, we'd want to have first name and last name. OK, that's, that's a thing that we can do in raw SQL. We're going to come out and go to the one raw SQL folder. Unfortunately, my schema right now has full name, not first name and last name. So what am I going to do? I don't really have a good way of moving between full name and first name, last name. You could put a migration. I could write a migration, but we're not using SQLize. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do the thing that we do in, in most in some, some applications in this company. Uh, I <laughs> new table. Delete <laughs> <laughs> database. New database. I am going to drop the table. So the yeah. script that I just run is drop table person. There's nothing here. My application, you know, I just drop my table. There's there's nothing there. What happened? Then I got a connection error because person doesn't exist because I just dropped my table. But that's okay. That's okay. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. Okay. Isn't there uh -huh. an SQL query you can run to create a new table based on like separating the first name and the last name? There is. Yeah. There is. But it gets cumbersome very quickly. Yeah. Because right now I've got in this in this folder, I've got three just, just straight SQL commands. And I'm just running them by hand manually. So you can think about this as doing manual migrations, which we'll talk about later, but it's just, it's just difficult to, to keep track of. So the easiest thing to do is I'm just going to drop the table, and I'm going to create another table with you know first name, last name, and another seed that instead of inserting full name, inserts first name, last name. Mm -hmm. What if it's a production database or something like that? Well, if it's a production database, what you can do is you can write a, a script in, in raw SQL uh, and you know, SSH into the box and, and run the thing. You could do that. Okay. Um, but you'd have no way of knowing what things have, what operations have happened on the database uh, without, say, going back and looking at the Postgres logs. So, and if mm -hmm. you were to do that, the command you'd run would be like, an alter table command to add um, columns and things like this. Yes, no. uh, you could you could do an alter table command, um, or you could instead of altering the column or renaming the column, you could add the full name column. Sorry, you could add the first name and last name column. Yeah. Migrate full name to first name last name, and then drop the full name column, uh, which is a probably a cleaner way of doing it than an alter or a rename. So I'm going to run. Uh, ba, ba, ba. What's the problem? That's the problem. I'm going to create my table. I've got a new schema now. Looks good. I can do an insert now. I can see that the new schema has taken. And let's just restart our old server. OK. In my server, I was just presenting what was in the database because it was expedient. But now my database model has changed. I've got first name, last name instead of full name. So your API. So now my API has changed and I've broken my contract. Yeah. It's too bad. That is too bad. Okay, so we're we're, st we're still we're still not cooking with gas yet. We're going to do this in SQL in Express. So what I can do is I can kill this application. Kill it, kill it with fire. And I can open up my application, and I can keep my controller exactly the same because I'm just doing a select query um, against person, and now. I'm getting data back from the database, but I want to keep my my contract in place. So in the route, I'm just going to do some cleanup, just sort of manually. I'm going to say, all right, we're going to detect whether we have full name or first name, last name, and use full name if we have it, and you know, combine first name, last name if we don't have it. But I'm doing it in the application. Um, in this case, I'm doing it in the route. I could also do it in the controller.
Hey, we're back. Ooh. Is it advised to do that type of logic in the route, or no. does it not matter? It, no. it, it, it's you coming back to the presentation. <laughs> Exactly. These two problems that I just shown you is exactly why SQLize exists. Um, it exists to help you with uh, your SQL in something called a, a model and also with your migrations. Um, so stepping back a little bit, uh, ORM stands for Object Relational Mapper. But we're now we're going to put that in the context of sort of your stack. At the very top level, you have your web framework. That web framework can then use a ORM. So instead of relying on writing, say, select star in person, I can define a model for a person, and I can say person dot find all, and that person dot find all will write a query for me behind the scenes, and I don't have to worry about the implementation details as much. That ORM also uses a migration tool. So if I change my underlying database schema, SQLize, not CLI, not SQLize, gives you a way of moving from full name to first name, last name. And that's the essence of a migration. You're making changes to your underlying data model, usually logical and physical model, and, and keeping track of them in a sensible way. When I use an ORM, and I have like a person object, and I do something like person dot find all, I am using a query builder, mm -hmm. implicit. Um, this is also called a data access object. Uh, it's basically a, the data access object is a class that gives you access to the operations that are in SQL. And the ORM is a class that gives you access to the attributes that are defined in the model, which uses a query builder. And then underlying all of this is your client. In this case, it's a Postgres client. I thought the acronym was data abstraction object. I might be wrong. I mean, well, I'm probably wrong. No, I don't, I, I, there, there are a lot of names used for these things. Um, but in, 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 the, the TLDR is you go from the client to the query build to a migration tool to an ORM to a web framework. ORM and migration tools kind of sit side by side, but in this case, we're going to think about um, models driving migrations, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And what is SQLize? Is, SQLize? Is SQLize packaging all those layers no. in one library? So SQLize proper handles the ORM, okay. which is it will handle relationships between people and rooms. Mm -hmm. SQLize also supports query building. Got it. So I can say person dot find all, or I can say person dot find all through another object, mm -hmm. which is your query building. So you have this class, which has validations and attributes and all the rest of it, which is the SQLized model, and you can run queries against that model. Um, SQLized CLI is distinct from SQLize, and SQLized CLI is actually what handles your migrations. And it uses a tool called Umzug behind the scenes, which you've probably heard Mike talk about. Yeah. Um, there are many ORMs out there. Uh, another popular one that I like is called Bookshelf. Bookshelf works analogously. Instead of SQLize being your ORM, you're using Bookshelf. Bookshelf uses Nex as its migration tool instead of Umzug. And Nex also has a query builder, just like SQLize. And there's maybe a half dozen of these relatively popular ORMs. Um, and what they all have in common is that they cover one, two, or three of ORM migration tool in Query Builder. Some of which, some are, are very, very specific, so that they only do, like they only do the ORM. Some do both ORM and migrations. Almost every, almost every ORM also includes a Query Builder because it just makes things easy when you're dealing with the objects. So what this looks like in code is we've seen the raw SQL before. We can write that in the uh, this ORM language. And our ORM can actually take care of a lot of stuff for us. Um, so we're defining a SQLized defined, which is a class of person. Now, because I'm dealing with an object now, 
I can subclass it. I can use all of the nice syntactic sugar that JavaScript gives you. I can use prototypical inheritance, for example. So I can say Ryan extends person and has special attributes for Ryan that might only exist in the application or might exist in the database as well. But I don't care because at this point I'm using the model. Um, I don't have to worry about my created at and updated at because SQLize Define does it for me. If there was another sort of attribute that I wanted to exist in all models, say for example a model version, I could define that once in SQLize and then it will automatically propagate to everything that was defined. Um, I can use easier data types for consistency. Um, I can use a data type string and the data type string will know that it's a var char of some lifts and I can update it in one place if I so desire. Um, if I have problems with mapping between the SQL and the ORM, say I have differences in like uh, attribute names, they're named inconsistently, which happens in legacy systems. Somebody's used camel case, somebody else uses snake case, somebody else uses all upper scores. I can abstract that away in the ORM by defining what the attribute names are. How, how how can you do that? Like so, if the if the person who designed the database made it in camel case, mm -hmm. you're saying that you can just define it in SQLize as not camel case, and then it'll exactly. just write over the database. Exactly. So I can say in SQLize, I'm going to have um, snake case for all my names, mm -hmm. and I can say in one place, actually this uses camel case in this particular table or this particular attribute, mm -hmm. and I can just write it into my model, so I don't have to worry about it when I'm in the application code. I can hit the model, and the model handles. Um, some of the implementation but details. it doesn't actually change the physical no you could do a migration to change the physical, physical db but but in for a legacy database you probably put it in your model cool can i jump in mm -hmm. a very common thing people do uh, uh is it's, it's very common for people to do all lowercase snake case in their database names mm -hmm. because well I'll just keep moving forward. And it's, it's quite common for people then to automatically convert all of those attributes to camel case. Um, and so in your JavaScript, as Ryan mentioned, your uh, full name attribute would be camel case full name. And it's such a common pattern. I don't know, I don't remember if it was when I was using SQL size or connects and bookshelf or, or in all cases, that that's the default behavior. Uh, and so if you don't customize any of these options, uh, it'll do that automatically for you. Yep. Uh, and you notice I use underscore true here because I prefer the straight underscore convention. So if I did not have underscore true, the created at and updated at would be in camel case and not snake case. Uh, and there are other, just there are other like options that you can put in here. Um, some of which come from SQLize and some of which come from the SQLize plugin ecosystem which we'll talk about at the very end. So it's just a, it's a very powerful, relatively battery included thing. You can write in this model language and you, 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 have, you, can, you have to think less about the underlying SQL as you're writing your application. So the two big things an RM gives you is a virtual object and some abstractions. Um, when I say a virtual object, people is a table. And if I wanted to select star from people, that would be person find all. Person being the model, find all being a query run on that model. And here are some other sort of pretty common ones. Um, when you're dealing with complex queries with a bunch of variables, your raw SQL can get very messy very quickly, particularly if you have to worry about escaping. With SQLize, you can sort of build things in components. You can actually have like a, a where clause, which uses a SQLize domain specific language. You can define a complex query and you can say person dot find all, throw a where object in there, which you've defined elsewhere. Um, because all of your models are classes, uh, you can include some, you can include scopes or functions on them as well to define custom behavior, which can be very useful. So instead of writing model specific logic and either your router or your controller you can put it directly in the model and it can be shared everywhere what's an example of a function that you would write onto a model so going from 
first name, last name to full name, oh. is an example of something you can put on the model. Okay. Um, and you can put it on the model in a couple of different ways. You can put it on the model um, as, a, as a straight function. So that means you're not writing to the database. You're saying when you, when you do person dot full name, it'll return the full name. Yeah. You can also um, put getters and setters onto the model such that you impact the database itself. Got it. So you can either, when you're dealing with the model, you can do things that are specific to that model or things that hit the database. You also get uh, associations, which is probably the most powerful part of ORMs. So if I'm running queries on city and country, I can just think about city and country without the, like how exactly the relationship is spec'd out in the physical model. When you're writing, the, the, the back-end developer that's actually writing the models needs to have some understand, or it's useful to have some understanding of the physical model. But if you're an application developer using the model, it's abstracted. Where people can run into trouble is they ignore the physical model entirely and let SQLize do everything for them. And if you do that, you can make some really, really cracked up database schema. Oh, yeah. I was actually going to ask you about that. Because you can define all your tables in SQLize, right? Yes. And then, yeah. So it's, ORMs are useful as an abstraction layer, and they can reduce the number of people that need to have an understanding of the physical model. They do not obviate the need to understand what's going on in the database. Does that make sense? So you would never initialize a table with a model, even though you could? Well, we'll, we'll I'll show you an example. Okay. So some people use ORMs. So ORMs are really, really useful, mm -hmm. uh, but you can use them as a crutch. Yeah. Um, if you are a front-end developer or you are, I guess, a, a, a full-stack developer that's working in an existing application that uses an ORM, you can get by without thinking about the database. If you're a back-end developer that is writing models, you still need to have a grasp of SQL. So it reduces the number of people that might need knowledge of the physical model, but it doesn't eliminate it. Uh, ORMs can also be used for NoSQL frameworks. SQLize is for relational databases. So Maria, MySQL, uh, Postgres, Oracle, etc. They might not have an Oracle adapter. I think you can use MongoDB with SQLize. Not out of the box. There is there is no dialect for a Mongo in SQLize. Hmm. Um, there, there might be a plugin for it, but within SQLize proper, there's no dialect for it. Hmm. Um, we're not talking about object relational mapping and NoSQL databases, but it's a thing that you can do. Um, the 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 impetus is a little bit different. Um, you're looking more so you can put any arbitrary key value blob in Mongo. But you can do schema enforcement on insert, and Mongoose can do that for you. And you can also write queries on like person objects, which refer to a person collection, et cetera. That has a particular schema enforcement on insert mm -hmm. and update. But not the focus of this talk. It's just a thing that you can do if you happen to be running across Mongo. All right. Now we're going to come back and use SQLize. I'm ready. Yes. Da, da. All right. So the finished example is in two SQLize. Okay. Uh, but what I'm going to do is actually come back to the raw SQL and walk through how you would go from um, we have raw SQL to actually building a model in SQLize. So the first thing you do is you install SQLize and SQLize CLI. SQLize is not a dev dependency. SQLize CLI is a dev dependency. So now we've got SQLize and SQLize CLI. SQLize CLI can be accessed via node modules bin. And these are all the options. 
just like you can use Express Generator to generate the boilerplate for a SQL for an Express application, you can use a SQLized CLI to generate the boilerplate for a SQLized application. So I'm going to init. Yeah. Init creates config, models, migrations, and seeders. We're going to go through them in sequence. Config is how you connect to your database. That's it. We're going to ignore these. We've got development. My username is Postgres. My password is admin. My database name is DemoDB. Dialect is what you is how you instruct SQLize which client to use. So if you're using Postgres, you're using PG by default. If you're using MySQL, you're using some other adapter. And Steven asked a question about whether NoSQL dialects were supported, and my answer was I am like 99% sure not, but you can check the API documentation. And if you were doing that, you would look up SQLized dialect and look at the supported dialects. Cool. You can also define your config in a SQLize, in a, in a dot file, so like dot SQLize RC. But right now, we're defining it in config.json. Now we can look at our models. Right now we don't have any models, we just have this index file. And this index file um, will automatically load all of your models into a DB object. So I can say db.sqlize, uppercase, which is the um, everything. It, it's the, it's like require sqlize. Lowercase sqlize, which is a connection to a specific database, which is defined in uh, config.js, and then sqlize.person, for example, if I want to refer to it. So db.person, if I want to refer to a specific model. We're going to talk about migrations later. So right now, I'm going to stop at configs and models. Going back to SQLize, we can see what else we can do here. Ooh, we can generate a model. I'm going to cheat a bit so I don't have to remember the command for generating a model. So using model generate, the name of the command of the table is person. The attribute is full name and we're gonna we're gonna declare that we're using the underscored style instead of camel case. For the default. Um, yeah, for the default. Yeah. Um, uh, you're just doing this because you you want to you want to show us how to generate a model from the command line, and because you want to might you want to use equalize to to demonstrate migrating from full name to first name, last name. Yes. So you're just creating this model that's got full name and it just was there for example purposes. Yes. And then if we were really doing this, all our models would be defined in JavaScript. Well, no, so the, 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 the model is defined in JavaScript. So when I run the SQLize CLI command to generate a model, it generates, it generates the JavaScript model for you. It literally auto generates the JavaScript file. Yes. Wow. So one of the the weaknesses that we're going to come to later um, is that SQLize doesn't have built in support within SQLize or SQLize CLI from going from an existing database schema to a model or from a model to a migration. What it does have support for is generating an initial model and migration. So right now, I generated that model. The migration for that model was also created. Cool. But if I were to update the model, it does not automatically update the migration. So if you're just using SQLize and SQLize CLI, you have to manually keep your migrations and models in sync. There are other tools that are not in SQLize proper that can help you do that, um, but um, that's outside the scope of this talk. How did SQLize know what to write as the migration? 
Like, wouldn't it have to know what the table looked like before? Nope, because this is a new table. So I am. So it's not really a migration that it wrote automatically. It wrote the first migration. The first migration first is migration gone from, from nothing. nothing. Okay. Exactly. Great. Got it. Yeah. So, so uh -huh. if I may, when you did SQLize model colon generate, mm -hmm. that generated a JavaScript file. Yes, it generated two JavaScript files. It generated a model <laughs> and the first migration. Got it. So the thing you're talking about, a crutch, and like you getting really weird looking databases, is like using this CLI to generate your tables instead of using like SQL to generate your tables because um, you might want to generate some very specific tables to like make your mapping make more sense. Yes and no. So when you define your tables, you're doing it via the migration and the model uses the migration. It's fine for simple things to use the default migration and model. If you're doing some really complicated stuff, it's very useful to have an understanding of what's going in. So you're not writing your migrations and you're not writing your migrations in SQL, you're writing them in um, a domain specific language, this query interface language. So if I, um wanted to make some complicated stuff, I could do it with like SQLize dot define table, whatever, like belongs to many and stuff like that. Exactly. As long as I'm using like that and not doing any auto generated stuff, I should be good. Or are you saying something else? The auto generation will get you a long way. If you're dealing with relatively simple data models and relatively simple associations, auto generation will work just fine. But like, yeah, so so like many to one and one to many relationships and stuff like that. The 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 language, the SQLized language, is good enough for, for for generating like like we don't have to worry about using those and knowing the actual SQL that is using that that is using under the hood. Correct. So there's sort of three buckets. There is. The CLI can generate it for me. Mm -hmm. There is the CLI will generate the scaffolding and I need to modify it a bit using SQLize's domain specific language, which covers 99% of use cases. And then there is something is happening. In, I need something that's happening in SQL that is not available via the SQLize domain specific language. If you get to that final bucket, if you're writing, if you're using SQLize to make raw SQL commands, that's that's a smell that you're probably doing something wrong. There are some cases in which you might need to do it, but normally you, you don't. The distinction is between the auto generation and having to write it yourself. So some things can be auto generated, some things you'll have to write yourself. So the relationships and knowing like to to um, knowing to create the intermediate table, for example, for many to many, right. is something that you will probably have to write yourself. Right. Um, a one-to-one -one relationship will, pro I think, can be auto-generated. Go ahead, James. Quick question. Mm -hmm. um, does it typically pay to do, when you write queries, you just use the uh, um, equalize instructor, like the daisy chain and everything, or do you okay to write out the query itself and the string is different? James, I could not understand you. It's asking if you should, um, what the idea is. It's asking if, uh, when we think you should write like raw SQL versus using the SQLize functionality. Uh, you should almost never be writing raw SQL. If you find yourself writing raw SQL, that's that's a that's a that's a code smell. The this. Does that answer your question? Uh, I think so. I was just wondering, like, if, if it's not a preference thing, if you still prefer that you use SQLize instead of writing out the script for yourself? Um. You were really quiet, James, but I think Ryan is saying that <clears throat> you should never write raw SQL, um, which I think can be debated on, but not here. So, so. Okay. 
Um, so that gives us our migration. Now what I can do uh, I'm going to skip that. You can also generate the cedar, as this is a lot of typing, you can generate the cedar uh, as well from the command line. The, the cedar. So if we're going back here, I've got a config, I've got my model, I've got my migration. There's no seeds, which means that I would generate a, um, a schema with there be no data in it, just like when I ran that first SQL command to generate the table, but there's no data. SQLize has a command for that as well. Uh, da, da, da. And that will generate my cedar. And the cedar it has the same format as migration up and down, but instead of defining the uh, the the, um, the table, you're doing inserts and deletions and transforms of existing data. Um, I'm going to switch over to two, so I don't have to write out all the boilerplate. Yeah. So it just it just gives you it gives you the scaffold. Gives you the scaffold. Exactly. And once you, yep. So is the idea that say you started with a really simple user's table at the beginning of your project, you would run uh, SQL as model generate once, uh, and that would create your model and your migration for it, files automatically generated, maybe you, you generate fine. And then over the course of time, as you make changes, you want to make changes to that table, you would come into your model and manually change the auto-generated model file, and you go into your migrations and manually change the migration um, all to match what you wanted, and it would, and you'd never, you'd never again run SQLize model generate. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, but clarification. The model generation, the migration generation, and the C generation all give you a scaffold. When you use the model generation and define attributes, it can put some stuff in that scaffold for you automatically. Any subsequent updates will not propagate using baseline SQL lies and SQL lies CLI. I don't know what you mean by any subsequent updates. So if I have a model, yeah. uh, and I want to change for full name to first name, last name, the migration and seeds will not auto, will, will, there's, there's SQLize and SQLize CLI don't have a way to automatically um, update the migrations and seeds from the model. You have to do it manually. Right. So you have to manually ensure that your model and migration and seeds all agree and do the same thing you want them to do. Yes. However, there are two workflows to bear in mind. Um, when you are in development, you can use a, a model-driven development workflow, which does not use migrations or seeds. Migrations are important when you get to production. In development, I can update my model and SQLize can dump that model or sync that model to the database and overwrite whatever is in the database. Let me demonstrate. I think it'll make more sense if I do. Um, so we are going to require the DB. DB has person, which is defined in the model. I can look in my database. And Drop the, drop the table. So there's nothing in this database right now. I can then take 
the DB person model and I can sync it. So I'm taking a model, forget about migrations, forget about seeds, and SQLize is syncing it directly to the database. Is that what the that DB that person sync? What 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 command were you in? Were you in just node? I was in node. node. Yes, that, that's that's just a node. Now, there are two different workflows. There's the development workflow and the production workflow. If you're in development and you don't care about your, you know, your database, it's, it's, it's a really great workflow, this model-driven workflow where, you, where, you're, where you're sort of updating your model. And you're like, all right, so I don't, uh, all right, so I don't really like this model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop out and actually give me something that a person has. Uh, uh, blood type. Age is good too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm good at brainstorming. I like it. I'm just going to call it a string. Now I can go back in Node. This this sync will fail because the thing already exists. It won't overwrite your data. But I can force it. And now we've got blood type appearing. This sort of this model-driven workflow is really, really good for development. It's really, really shitty for production. Mm -hmm. In production, yeah. once you've got your database out there, every change to your schema needs to be encoded in a migration. Mm -hmm. So two separate workflows. Development, you can you can kind of forget about migrations a bit. You can write your model, and you can you can force changes from the model directly into the database. As soon as you go to production, every change to a model must be encoded in a migration. And we'll go through that next. But let me finish with this example. We got a little bit off topic. So now we are going to exit out of this. And we're going to use the SQLize CLI to start up our application again. Cool. So these are all of our SQLize commands. We're going to drop our database. We're going to create our database. Now we can connect again. There's nothing here. Now, we want to run our migrations. So we can look at our migrate status. Right now, no migrations have been applied. We can migrate our database, and that ran the only script that was in that directory. If you had, say, 10 migrations, the migrations would run in sequence. And you can also choose which migration to run to with the to command if you had multiple migrations. And we'll see this in the next example. Now I've ran my migration. I can see that I have a table, and I've also got SQLized meta. SQLized meta, you can think of as a lock table, which keeps track of the migrations and also the seeds that have been run on the database. How does the SQLized table know where a migration was run JavaScript? It's a lock file. So within this. SQLize meta. It has the names of the migrations that were run. And the migration format by default has a timestamp of when they were created, so they're run sequentially. Yeah, that's only when you use the SQLize migrate command. Yes. Yeah, okay. So again, s model syncing, development. Right. Migrations, right. production. Right. Should we all do it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we have our migrations. Uh, we can also do our seed. And to do our seed, we have to give it a seed file. That's our seed file. So there we are.
So now we've gone from using these just a, a jumble of SQL files to putting it into a structure of models, migrations, and seeds. You define your model. That's what you use as your RM. The model is backed by a migration. The data that you're using, like your fixtures and such, are your seeds. Now that, that app, now that we have our database in place, we can run our application. And we get the exact same thing. ID, full name, and created at, updated at. To accomplish this, our application hasn't changed. The uh, app.js hasn't changed at all. We're still using get people. However, get people is using SQLize now. So instead of having to write the raw query, we can say db.person. And if we wanted to refer to some other thing or some other relation, we could do db.room or whatever. And we have this very powerful you know, query language that's built into SQLize. So I'm returning people, an object. I have a function that SQLize gives me for free called to JSON, which serializes it to JSON. And I return that JSON object. Um, do you guys want a break or do you want to go through migrations, which is the next, the final example? Because it's three o'clock. I'm good to keep going. But okay. How, how are people on the phone I'm feel? Okay. Can we, can we break? If we have any leftover questions from the last part, can we ask them now or should we wait to the end? Of well, we'll wait to the end if we're going to keep going. Great. Sorry, Robert. I think I got to leave you. Okay. Um, so migrations define the schema. Right now we have full name. Say I want to update the first name, last name. I've made a change to the underlying database schema. Going from full name to first name, last name. When you're thinking about migrations, there are sort of, I guess, three things to keep in mind. There's your release or your git commit, your models, and your migrations. So let's say we start off and release uh, 0 0.1. We define two models, sales and product. We can do our development work on them. We can do the syncing, et cetera. But then we, get, we actually we give it to a customer. So we have a migration in place. Now, next month, we want to make some changes to product and some changes, ch and we want to add a store. We go into the product.js file and we modify it, which is where you see like the git, you know, plus minus. Mm -hmm. And we add, we can use like, uh, you know, SQLize model generate to create the store. We then create a migration for 2018.02. So if I want to take the old uh, database from January, I can run the migration to get it with the current model. If I want to check out version 0 0.1, I can migrate up to 2018.01. Now in March, we go ahead and we change all of our models, sales, product, and store. We create another migration which captures those changes to the database. Why did you have an initial, oh, the initial migration is just The initial migration is going from nothing, no table to nothing, an empty database to your first table. Got it. Um, Seeds define data. So select star from people. These these things, you know, John Watts and Charles Ingram come from seeds. Migration defines ID created at, updated at, first name, last name. Seeds defines the rows that are inserted into that schema. Now we're going to do a demo with SQLize with migrations. Do. Okay. So we cannot 
update our we have to update our models and our migration separately. So we're going to update our model. So instead of being full name, we'll do first name and last name. Cool. You could sync that, but that's not useful for production. Now we can come over to our migrations. And we can update our migration. So right now we're looking at the initial up and down. Yes. We are going to create a new, a new migration. And let's just call it first name, first last. That generates that migration for us. We now have two migrations. And it's up to us to write what that migration looks like. Briefly, there are going to be two steps in handling this migration. The first step is going to be not to create a table, uh, but to create a column. That column is going into people. And that column has some attributes. When you go down, this is pseudocode right now, by the way. You are removing the column. And first name and last name require some attributes, which will be here. Is there a reason you have, I know it's pseudocode, but is there a reason you wrote it twice up here? First name and last name. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Now, you might actually not want to remove the full name column in this migration. What you might want to do is create another migration so that things are in very clear skips. Mm -hmm. So now, in first and last, you insert your columns. And you remove your columns. And then next, in the next migration, you remove your full name. If you have existing data in the database, um, you, you would want a way of moving the data as well as the structure. So migration is about structure, but you can also write the migration to be about the data. So for example, alongside adding these columns, I could somehow go from full name to first name and then to the last name. So this is sort of the, the pseudocode. So you're changing the schema and then you're also migrating the data. What this looks like when it's all fleshed out is in three. We have create person, which is 
the same. There's no differences. The migrations don't change. Full name. We have the migration for first to last, which adds the column and then splits the full name into the first name and to the last name. If you wanted to be more robust here, you could use like a regex expression. Um, so the last name is only just the last key. So for example, somebody could have a full name of Ryan M. Harrison, this wouldn't support that. And then the down is to remove first name, last name. Then, you can remove your full name column. And we can do this sequentially. So let's see what that looks like going through the migrations. We are going to run our db drop command to drop our database. And we're going to create another database. And we're going to log into that database. We're going to see that there's nothing there. Then we're going to run our first migration, which is uh, a DB migrate. We can look at the status. We can see that this database doesn't have any of the migrations applied. We can then do a DB migrate to this specific migration which will run that specific migration. And we can see the schema change. We can then seed with the full name. So now we've got data in our table under this full name format. We can then apply our next migration. Which applies the up command when you do the migration. So we've got full name and first name. If for whatever reason this didn't work for us, we could look at our status to see where we are. I can see that the first two migrations have been applied. Maybe I don't want that migration. Undo will apply the down operation. That's good. It's all atomic. When you write when you, when you when you when you take the time to write your migrations up and down, you can you can go to any database snapshot. So if I if I need to revert the change, I just did an undo and I I, I went from you know, this intermediate state of full name, first name, last name, back to full name. Before you do this in production, obviously, you take a snapshot of your database and so. Now, I can run all of the migrations. And we can see the progression of full name full name, first name, drop full name. And we can start our application. <laughs> and it's an API. So it says the exact same thing. It still says full name. But how you got to the full names changed a bit. Previously, We had to write some, some, some just custom logic in our router, or you could have put it in the controller. Now this logic is going to go into the model in a much more sensible way. We're going to use a function prototype called full name. So if I ever want to get the full name from the model, I can type person full name. And I also want to use a custom serializer for my JSON. And any and you can add you can add validation here as well if you if you need to. So now the the sort of your 
your, your application code needs to concern itself less with the model. You can take a model and then do things with the model without having to worry about the, the underlying details. If you wanted to, instead of using this prototype, you could also use getters and setters. Um, but um, uh, that's, a, that's another topic entirely. If you want to see what this looks like, we can come into node. We have our db.person. And I can do a db.person. Let's do a find one. Then I can chain it. And just to make this easy, I'm going to do something like that. So now I have my object i. This is the this is the the default serialization. This is my custom serialization. That's my full name. And you can, you, I mean, you, anything that you can do with a JavaScript class or a JavaScript object, you can do with a SQLized model. So it's it can it's very powerful. Can you show us the definition of JSON custom? Yeah. Cool, it's just great. So you're just using standard object oriented JavaScript. You're using the default function, you're using the, the, the prototype for the two JSON, deleting first name and last name, and adding full name. So that any any changes that would happen to the object will be propagated here. Mm. Or you could hard code it. It's, I, I, I did it this way because it was um, it was a way to show like a really simple object oriented JavaScript thing. Oh ew, man, um, yeah. The new version is classes, right? It uses classes, so you don't need to deal with prototypes. I'm not sure what version are you. Okay, uh, it, it doesn't, it, it, so you, you can write in either style. Uh, I didn't want to have to deal with uh, like uh, any sort of transpilation, so I just wrote in straight ES6. Okay. Uh, and I believe the classes um, are in ES7. No classes in ES6. All right, so I could have written it in classes, I just chose not to. Right, and SQLite 4 is actually all classes, so they moved to classes in SQLite 4, so... Okay. Man. So, some strengths of SQLize are that development style, model-driven development, really awesome. Uh, as Austin mentioned, all SQLized models are JavaScript classes, so you can use all the things. Uh, they also have lifecycle hooks. So if you needed to do some sort of application-wide state management, you can say like a, a SQLized before save hook and run some custom code there. Uh, and kind of the same way that you would use a Git hook. A lot of the weaknesses of SQLize are addressed by the ecosystem. So one of the limitations that we had come across with the model-driven development is if you're using street SQLize, if you have an existing DB schema, you have to you have to create your model by hand. Uh, SQLize has an officially supported tool for that called SQLize Auto to generate your models from your database schema. If you want to generate migrations from models, uh, there is a, uh, a, a a project called SQLize Auto Migrations that's done by a third party contributor. Um, and this is a long-standing issue with SQLize. Um, th this, this, um, this issue dates from like 2015. They know that it's a problem. You can't generate migrations from models. They just haven't got around to doing it. There have been attempts over the past four years of various third parties addressing it. SQLize Auto Migrations is, is the latest one. It's incomplete, um, but, but it will give you a scaffold to start from. So you don't have to start from scratch. Um, and these are just some other things out there that are going to be useful, sort of model versioning, nesting hierarchies, and fixtures. Fixtures can come in handy for tests, for example. So instead of instead of loading um, uh, with the seeders, this fixtures thing allows you to just give it a JSON file and it pops that up. Hmm. Um, and then there are a couple of uh, of gotchas in SQLize. Um, so in in the documentation, you'll see version 
version does not refer to model versions. It refers to something else. Wow, sorry about that. Questions? Sure. Um, just curious, do you prefer Connection Bookshelf or SQLize? I, I have limited to moderate experience and I prefer Connection Bookshelf and I was curious uh, if you had more expense, uh, experience with all the tools and the sort of one or two or a few highlight reasons why you prefer what you prefer. Gotcha. Um, I at, the, at my previous company, I, I chose Bookshelf. Um, I prefer the way that Next does its migrations. They're very similar. I just prefer a Next migration, so I, I chose Bookshelf as my ORM. Um, SQLize has become more popular over the past two years. It was a little bit more popular two years ago. Now it's um, like a lot more popular, like by a factor of five. Uh, and SQLize is also what we use internally. Um, in our microservices, uh, which is why this talk is on SQLize. Um, mm -hmm. They are so similar that it's just not worth switching. Um, Bookshelf, I, I believe, is also older than SQLize. But these same sort of limitations, to the best of my knowledge, are also with Bookshelf. So Bookshelf, to the best, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from two and a half year old knowledge, but um, doesn't do the DB to models or the models to migrations either. So did you guys move like continuous integration using SQLize uh, maker migrations now? Like for the microservices? Um, I don't understand the question. So if you change, uh, if you add a migration in the code, you continuous in our continuous integration like Jenkins? No. Automatically handling everything right now? No, that's not written. Okay. It, it could be, but it's not. So because that's better, I think, a couple issues with that, like, um, let me understand what this so do you I think I did this in Rec Rec and then I ended up uh, keeping two models, one before the migrations and one the current. Is that the vision here or No. Um, your models stay up to date with your code and if you want to go back to a right. previous model, you go back to a previous git tag. Right. So but then if you check in the code Continuous migration will need to read it from a previous version. No, right? because the migration handles the database. So if you go back to this this table, the model files stay the same and you modify them over time. The migration files are added on sort of each database uh, change another migration. So the models and migration will be complete in the background. Okay. Yes. And, and it's an exercise for the user to keep them in sync. But you can use a tool um, like SQLize auto migrations to to give you some scaffolding. Um, one of the benefits of doing this sort of model or migration driven development is that in a CI environment, um, SQLize could run, you know, SQLize migrate and then run your code. And that should work on the CI server. Right now, you'd have to log. You'd have to have Nick log in to the Jenkins server, update the Postgres database on the Jenkins server, and then the yarn start would work. Um, you can also, with these migrations, you can you can kind of think about like your CD environment versus your CI environment. Your CI environment would start with a blank database, run all the migrations, run all the seeds, and run your code. Your CD environment would be like, um, you know, um, 
dev, I don't know, off service, dev.offservice.amitademo.com. And when you make a commit to develop, it would run the migrations on the tip of an existing database. I've got questions. Yeah. Um, so you talked about using the SQLized boilerplate, like SQLize init, mm -hmm. and you said that you seem to indicate that, that that's obviously separate than the boilerplate that comes with an express project, but wouldn't most, I think, I feel like a lot of our microservices use the boilerplate from both, right? Or it's not a mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. So I mean, I know that there are different things, obviously, but one creates the routes and the controllers folder. Exactly. The they're, 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 they're orthogonal. So in a real project, um, actually, let me do it on the command line. Um, this is exactly why I wrote the PR for the Amita auth service to sort of make a demonstrated example of how these things would work together. Mm-hmm. Um, so in our SRC folder, we have our express stuff, our express config, our express controllers, express helpers, routes, etc. Then there's a DB folder, which has our migrations, models, and seeds from SQLize. Cool. Um, since you're changing the default locations, you can either You can either update the SQLize config here to say this is where you look for your the, the, the files. I chose not to do that. I chose to use a SQLize RC file, which defines the new paths for config model seeders and migrations, since the default is to look in the base folder for model seeders and migrations. Got it. So they're, they're orthogonal. And how, how exactly you compose your folder structure uh, between uh, SQLize and Express is up to you. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is the structure that I chose uh, because it keeps things nice and tidy. Cool. It's mainly an Express application, and all your DB specific stuff is in this folder. Got it. It, it provides a, a clean like um, hierarchical separation between your Express stuff and your SQLize stuff. And because I specified this SQLize RC. If I wanted to generate a new a new migration or a new model, for example, I could do that. And that's my person model. Yeah. Very cool. I I don't know if anyone else on the phone has questions, but I got another question. Uh, so DB Sync seemed super useful. Like super powerful. Is there a reason that index.js in the models folder isn't just calling db sync on each of the models? Yes, because db sync will sync your current version of the model. Okay. Let us imagine that I connect it to an old database. Yeah. And with a new application. If I connect to. If I connect to an old database with an old release, fine. But as soon as I update my database and update, I need, to, I need as soon as I update my model, I need to update my my database accordingly, yes. and, and vice versa. Okay. Which is why DB Sync is phenomenal in development, but can get you in a lot of trouble in production. So, for example, you might have a production application that's running for a year with their own database. The application development moves along. And if you haven't written your migrations, you're going to be in for a world of hurt when it comes time to update the application that hasn't been updated in a year. 
it's also why processes like CI and eventually CD are all really useful because you you keep all your applications up to date and having migrations and seeds helps you keep your application up to date. It's no longer a big deal to change a model or change a database. And in terms of difficulty of changing, um, application code will generally change much more rapidly than models. Models will change much more rapidly than the underlying database. So if you're going to put thought yeah. into something, put thought into your database schema because it's the hardest thing to change. And the index.js inside models right now is using like a query interface create table command. And that is for some reason safer than a db.sync. No. No, 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 that no. That, no. That, it's just that that index.js only gets run if you don't have a database is what you're saying? No. So index that this, this file models index.js yeah. is giving you access to a, to a SQLized object. Mm -hmm. When I am in my controller, I am using this the SQLized SQL object to find all. Yeah. Here, I was using the SQLized object to sync. And when I do this sync, I have data here right now. When I do this for sync, it's gonna be bad. all goes away. So they're, 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 they're separate. So I was showing you the sync as a development example mm -hmm. using the import statement. But here I'm just I'm, I'm not there's, there's no syncing happening in this application in development if you want to do a sync you can do it I recommend doing the sync outside of the application so that no mistakes are made um, so for example you could have a like um, you know uh, your, your your yarn migrate in development could be to sync the to sync your models but in the application code, I'd recommend staying away from sync because it gets you into trouble if when you move that from development to production. Cool. And when I make this, when I move from development to production, if I if I did the the the, the SQLized sync in for yarn migrate, when I go to production, I can just replace that yarn migrate command with SQLized migrate, which means the interface to all your CI tools, etc., remains the same. Like if you had an existing database, existing model, existing database, existing data, and you run and you in your let's say you then go to your model and you add a new column mm -hmm. and you run SQLized sync. SQLized sync like won't run, but then if you do force true, it will run. It will add your new column, but it'll also wipe all your wipe all your rows. That is that is, that is correct. There is another SQLized sync command called alter. Um, which will do non-destructive operations and not the destructive operations. So if you wanted to add a column, your alter command can do that. And again, absolutely fine in development. Do not use SQLized sync in production. Uh, and and the, the, the distinction is the, the moment that there is data that you can't wipe out just willy-nilly, that means just this is data I do not care about, you should be using migrations. Um, and for me, anything that is beyond things that are in seeders or fixtures or just like test data from playing with it, uh, I, would, I would use migrations. Anybody else? Beautiful. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, I apologize for, for running over. Um, 
I, I, I just thought that if I didn't include the raw SQL example, that the SQLize wouldn't make much sense. So that's why I, I tried to do the that raw SQL example and then show you the progression of going from raw SQL, raw SQL breaks down from models and migrations, and then SQLize can handle both of those problems separately. Yeah, this is a good dev review. Um, so yes. Uh, all right, now I want to.